So welcome everyone to my lecture on solution focused solution based therapies. These are definitely some of the more popular approaches in practice today, I would say. And certainly you see them widely used in mental health by all in all disciplines, you know, um, solution therapies actually grew out of family therapy and actually out of systemic family therapy. Um, so definitely in family therapists, you know, are trained much, uh, very widely in solution focused. It is very popular with professional counselors, social workers, and psychologists. So you will see all the mental health dis disciplines, um, you know, using solution focused, talking about it, researching it. You will also notice though, it is used widely outside of the field. So um, if you look at um, business, there's a lot of business consultation around solution focused, life coaching, um, using solution focused therapies, school counseling. Um, solution focus is one of the main approaches because it is quick and efficient and positive. Um, so you will definitely see it used very widely in school counseling. So there are a lot of disciplines um, outside of even mental health formally that are using solution-focused therapy, solution-based therapy. And I definitely think no matter which theoretical orientation you gravitate towards, that understanding solution-focused principles, especially how to identify strengths, which is much harder than identifying problems, and helping clients really solidify, stabilize, you know, what works is essential um, no matter where you're working from, because this is how you do that last phase um, of therapy where you are stabilizing whatever gains were made in treatment. And solution focused certainly has some of the best developed interventions for doing this. So I'm so excited that you're here and I am excited to share more with you about solution focused therapy. So if you look at, if you have some of my textbooks, you will see that there are three main kind of strands of solution focused. And the classic form of solution focused therapy is solution focused brief therapy, SFBT. And so you really want to distinguish this from just plain solution focused and then solution oriented therapy, which is, is similar. Um, it was developed, um, you know, by Bill O'Hanlon, Michelle Wiener Davis, um, probably uses, I would say some more linguistic, you know, interventions, but these are different and the research streams are different, especially if you're looking at research, but solution um, focused brief therapy is the one developed by Steve DeShazer and his wife, Insu Kim Berg. Steve originally studied at the MRI Institute um, with Paul Watzlawick and Richard Fish and the whole team there in the very early years of family therapy. So this actually goes back. And if you're, if you are familiar with uh, what they did at the Mental Research Institute, the MRI Institute, they looked at the interaction pattern around the problem. And so Steve studied this and worked with the team. And then he uh, came back to Milwaukee. And when he was working with his team, he kind of came up with the realization that we don't even really need to talk about the problem. We can just figure out what the solution is because sometimes the solution isn't necessarily related to the problem. And so the most classic example I can think of of this, and there are many, is that for many families, they may come in with a child who has behavioral problems, right? But the solution may be that we need to work on, you know, increasing what would maybe, you know, the relation, the strength of the relationship, the emotional bond, secure attachment, whatever you want to call it. But maybe that's what we actually need to be doing. And so sometimes, um, you know, what you're looking at in terms of the problem is, is not what needs to be focusing on that may not be the best way and the quickest way to help the client resolve the issue. And a very classic way where this happens in families a lot is oftentimes a family will present with a, um, a, a child who's got some kind of symptoms. You know, it could be depression, it could be behavioral issues, acting out. And after assessing the system, what is very common in families, although it's hard to believe in the beginning, but certainly uh, if you do family work a lot, you will come to recognize this, that there's the real problem is there, it is the tension between the couple Okay, that the kid acting out is drawing 
the couple's attention away from the marital issues. And so they're focusing on the kid. Obviously, this is not for all families, but it is a real dynamic that definitely happens. And uh, you often have to see it to believe it. So this was also something else that Steve, as a classically trained family therapist, was more, more than aware of. So, so, but in this case, um, you know, Steve's not necessarily thinking systemically like that. He is just noticing, you know, what would the solution look like and how do we address, how do we make that happen without like getting bogged down in all the past now? So, um, so that's some of what it looks like. And so, so yeah, so that's the basics. And those are some of the different terms you will see. And so solution focused is again, like um, just kind of a more, I would say like a third generation. There are a lot of folks out there who would call themselves solution focused. Um, but the original two kind of schools were more solution focused, brief therapy um, that happened at the, you know, Milwaukee Institute with Steven Insu. Um, and then you have solution oriented with Bill O'Hanlon and Michelle Weiner Davis. And, and Bill O'Hanlon certainly integrates a little more of the Erickson, Ericksonian hypnosis. So Ericksonian hypnosis, I should uh, just say, mention on this. It's a form of hypnosis developed by Milton Erickson who was a genius psychiatrist who was in Arizona, who, who used, it's, it's a much, let's just say a much less dramatic, simpler um, type of in, uh, hypnosis. It's not like you're getting sleepy. It's not that hypnosis, but it's using language that helps people kind of access some of the subconscious and in the Ericksonian hypnosis, you're always phrasing everything in the positive because the, the working hypothesis is that the, the mind, the subconscious mind doesn't think in negatives. So if I told you to think of a pink elephant, you just thought of a pink elephant, or I just told you not to think of a pink elephant. All you can do is still think of a pink elephant. And so it uses some of those principles um, to really help people get in touch with their strengths and resi resiliency. So, and it certainly is, um, the, there's an Ericksonian Institute that still does lots of training if you're interested in learning Ericksonian hypnosis. Um, but I would say it's one of the big misconceptions about solution focused. A lot of people see it as a very shallow, simplistic, you know, um, approach and to do it well, I do think there's a bit of this Ericksonian hypnosis, especially you can almost, you can really feel it in like the miracle question. There is this very skillful, very subtle use of language that you really do need to get in-depth training and supervision to, I think to really master this approach is no joke. And what I love about solution focused, even if you don't master the very subtle language that really characterizes using this approach well, and I would even say correctly, you can still stumble through a miracle question and doing really good clinical work. And so when my, I, you know, when my students ask me, what theory should I use? I don't know what to use. Um, it's like, if your supervisor isn't giving you a theory to use and you feel like you need something to hold on to, I would say solution focused, is the one approach like in your first year you can read my <laughs> read my textbook, follow along, pick you know um, learn how to use a miracle question not a miracle question a scaling question you know where are you this week what would it take to get half a point higher, and behaviorally define what that would look like, and you can get through most any session very very well and and your clients will achieve amazing change. So it really is a great one when you feel totally lost, especially in your early part of your career, because you don't even have to understand Steve DeShazer. He really was a, a genius, brilliant level theoretician that most people couldn't follow when he would talk. <laughs> um, he's a Wittgensteinian, a Wittgensteinian like philosopher and really got into the use of language and deconstruction and how we construct our, our, our realities through language. So really in a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant person and clinician. Um, but uh, even if you don't understand half of what he said, you can still do uh, really great things uh, with a lot of what's in this approach. So let's keep going here. So, so solution focused is really the first strength-based approach. When you hear strength-based therapy, think solution focused. That's uh, really, I think, another name for it as well. And 
there are some other approaches out there that call themselves strength strength based, but this is the original. Um, and it is intended to be brief. And that said, if you're working with someone with complex trauma, brief might be two years, okay? <laughs> Still briefer than many. And they they really spend a minimum of time talking about problems, but it doesn't mean they're cold, callous, insensitive, not empathetic to a person's pain. Doesn't mean they stop people from talking about their, you know, problems, but there is this gentle way that they move the conversation and it should be very gentle. It should be organic and it should feel right and paste right to the client. Really bad solution-focused therapy is like, well, let's not talk about the problem. Let's talk about what the solution looks like. That's not what's happening here, okay? Um, but there is this focus on moving towards enacting the solution. They are very action-focused. I mean, I think only behavioral therapists are more action-oriented than solution-focused. They want people to do action between um, sessions, and I think the greatest misconception most people have, many people have, and this is how you can tell well someone was trained well and solution focused. If you think you're giving your clients solution focused, that is not it. That is advice giving, everything that we taught you not to do in your first semester of your grad program. Solution focused therapists do not figure out solutions and hand them on a silver tray to their clients. That is so not what happens, okay? So what they are doing though is talking with clients to identify what the client's preferred solution might look like, and then helping them take these small incremental steps to make it happen. And so um, it is a very action-oriented, there is a, a generally a very positive, uplifting feel, very hopeful approach, um, which is solution-focused. So let's talk, let's do some myth busting because there's so much misunderstanding. There is a lot of really bad solution focused therapy out there. And so, like I just said, the number one myth that many people, even licensed people often have is that the solution based therapist is giving, suggesting, offering solutions to the client. That is not, so they are social constructionists. So if you're familiar with what narr happens in narrative and collaborative, we are, we're not we're not experts, even solution focused. You're not the expert. You are helping the client identify it, concretize it, make sure it's realistic and, and, and grounded in reality, and then helping them take whatever small steps, you're going to break it down to the tiniest steps necessary for clients to take action. That's all. But you're not giving that. You don't have to work that hard. That's the good news. So never think that you're giving advice. Um or doing anything other than helping understand what the client's envisioned solution is. You're helping the client in, figure out what the solution would be, but it does so does not come from you. It, it, it comes from you asking questions that help the client identify what it might be or how it might be or what, they, what they're looking for, depending on the type of problem. So another myth is that solution-based therapists never talk about problems. They, they absolutely do talk about problems <clears throat> they do talk about the past, uh, even though it's a very future focused, the most future focused approach out there, you still talk about problems. You still talk about past. You are still empathetic and caring and you want to hear about it, but they have some real subtle interventions, even when they're talking about problems that start creating room for possibilities. And this is some of the subtle languaging that definitely takes longer to get than memorizing the scripted, you know, scaling questions. There's some really easy scale, uh, scripted questions in this approach, but then there's a lot of subtlety in the language that will you just keep opening up and we'll talk about this as we go through the presentation today. So there's a real subtlety there. They're talking about it, but they, they know how to subtly frame it so that you keep opening up more doors and windows for possibilities and solutions and hope. There is also a myth that emotions are <clears throat> discussed in this approach. And what I would say with that is that um, the uh, emotions are discussed as needed, but it's not the focus and it's certainly not the focus of most interventions. And so there is a space for it. They do come up, they can get processed, but that's not where the, the focus necessarily of treatment is not so much 
discussing emotions and that, that they're it's curative to discuss them by themselves, like in humanism. It's more like the, the, the emotions, both, you know, the negative difficult ones around the problem, as well as positive emotions around enacting the solution. Um, they talk about both of these in juxtaposition, but it's, it isn't the hallmark um, focus of the approach. So when you look at this in terms of the um, unifying framework, some of you may be familiar with that I developed. Um, you will see that uh, solution focused is interesting in that it really does focus on narratives around the problem and your identity narrative as a person and a lot of the cognitions around what works and what doesn't. And it also really focuses on observable hate behavior more than any other postmodern approach. And actually, yeah, so it's got this grounding in behavior that is unique in, I would say, the, you know, if you look at narrative and collaborative, solution focus has a very strong behavioral and then cognitive piece together there, which is similar to cognitive behavioral therapy. It's also similar to systems therapy, systems and structural, also behavior anchored in um, cognitive. So, but that emotional piece and even looking at complementarity is less of what they do here. <clears throat> They do, they do, and we'll talk about a client's social location, but it's not as emphasized as that is a narrative or collaborative therapy. The solution focus is very focused on what is the client's, you know, solution, uh, you know, um, desired solution. What would that look like? And then how do we take small steps towards it? Very concrete. And so it's, it's got a lot of elements that are very reminiscent of cognitive behavioral, but also elements that are very similar with collaborative and narrative as well. Okay, so let's look at their significant contribution to the field, the juice, as I like to call it. So I think by far the most important thing that every clinician out there needs to know is how to assess for client strengths. Because the truth is, it is far more difficult than assessing for problems. And most clinicians do not get this, and most clinicians are terrible at assessing strengths. This is so much harder because clients come in ready to talk about problems. They are socialized to come into, you know, therapy and professional counseling to talk about their problems or bleh, right? That's what they're coming in for. And so it's, and oftentimes what has happened to draw from our narrative therapy friends, um, they, they, most people, by the time they come to therapy, 99% of people are living in what narrative therapists would call a problem saturated narrative, which is all they can see is the problem. You know, they can hardly remember when they weren't depressed or anxious. They can hardly remember the last time they were happy as a couple or a family. Like it's all the problem has gotten so big and out of control that now they need to spend a lot of time and money to get help with it, that most people come in where the problem is huge and that's all they can see. And so that is where most people come in. And so it takes a lot of skill to get clients kind of out of that worldview and helping them even literally remember <laughs> when things were better. And I have certainly sat with clients who have a hard time remembering, you know, when, th when their problem wasn't totally overrunning their life, it's like they see their, they've gone, I will tell you this, if you haven't worked with couples <clears throat> yet, most couples have this incredible ability to um, go back, you know, and let's go back and rewrite history, you know, in terms of you always felt this way. And I knew way back then, blah, blah, blah. You know, one of the things I teach my couples is never, and families as well, is never tease down. Teasing down, I define as you're teasing lovingly at someone's weakness or, you know, something, some foible they have. You just kind of tease them in a loving way. You can just kind of ribbing them a little bit. I'm sorry. I, I've been doing couples therapy, you know, family therapy for 30 years. And I can tell you what happens is everything that everyone was literally joking about it was endearing it was cute it added chemistry for couples it was this you know lovely joyful part of the relationship 
you know, five, seven years later, where all of this conflict has happened, when you're poking at the, you know, the little th annoyances of your partner in the beginning that were so cute and actually attractive, seven years later, man, even way back then, you didn't accept me the way I was. And people just go back and rewrite all of that. And so I always say you have to tease up if you're going to tease at all. It's very, it's good to laugh as a couple and a family. I think it's important, but you really need to be mindful about what you're laughing about because, you know, history gets rewritten and it gets rewritten where you really didn't accept me, love me, da, da, da. Yeah, it was always your favorite kid or whatever. Oh my God. But I know back then that there was really sincere kindness there. So humans have this incredible ability and it takes a lot of clinical skills to I listen for those strengths. And, it, and it's a muscle you kind of grow. And it's and, and so what I would say is, as, uh, as anyone is telling me a story, right, about what all the problem is, because that's where all the clients start, even when you're solution focused, you're listening for, you know, we're going to talk a lot about exceptions or why it didn't get worse than it, it got, you know, what things or context seem to make it better. I am listening for what I call shadow strengths, okay? So virtually any symptom that you have in a different context is a strength. And so by that, what I mean is, you know, it, let's just say you've got like obsessive anxiety where you worry about things over and over and over again, okay? So, and that's why you're coming in. Your anxiety is like off the charts, so what you, what them, the shadow strength to that is anyone who can obsess about things tends to be good at planning, tends to be good at identifying potential problems, tends to be good at thinking through things in a kind of a, a detailed way. So there's usually some sort of strength there that's the shadow side of that, right? If you've got a depressed person, someone who tends to be very depressed, okay? The research actually shows many people who are clinically depressed are more accurate at observing reality um, and, and assessing possibilities. So there is this shadow strength that might go there, you know, as well. So whatever is, um, you know, you know, going on, even like couples who fight, believe it or not, um, you know, couples who fight and actually have fights, it's actually a good sign for many couples because what happens after the fighting phase is the isolation and, uh, and distance cascade, as Gottman calls it, or the burned out pursuer, as Sue Johnson might call it, which is, you know, someone, some, they just stop even caring and trying and they're not going to even like, they just given up. There's like a white flag and that's actually harder. So some of those couples who we don't argue at all anymore, uh, they're often more far gone and harder to repair um, than a couple who is still having heated arguments, believe it or not. So, you you know, so there's shadow, whatever the strength is in a different context, it is a strength. And so having that mindset kind of helps you as a, as a clinician as well, figuring out where some of those strengths, and then certainly listening for hobbies and interests you know, just involvement of family and friends, you know, what, you know, if you're talking to an adult who's, you know, gainfully employed, you got skills from that, right? You know, and so I, I listen to what occupation, I pay attention to what occupation they have, because I know that they're going to be different skill sets. You know, if I'm talking to, you know, a lawyer or a CPA, a teacher, you know, um, all of these people have skill sets, that can both, let's say, harm a, you know, harm a relationship as much as it can help a relationship. So um, just being aware and knowing to pull from all of those. And then also just, you know, in terms of, you know, ethnicity, religious background, an identity-based community, there can be so many strengths. Um, oftentimes, marginalized communities are so much stronger than someone who doesn't belong to a quote-unquote marginalized community. Um, because often there's just more activity, there's more support, more willingness to support, um, you know, having a religious background there, you know, and being active, having an active religious or spiritual practice, there's tons of strengths and resiliency you can draw on as a clinician for that. So, and even, you know, different ethnic groups can have um, very well known and documented uh, strengths. And so often in terms of social support, which most people are extremely isolated today, it's, it's a huge problem. 
And so knowing, you know, what, who, what, where are their communities or their potential communities that we can plug into and draw from? So, you know, and the last thing I'll say about when I'm assessing for strengths is I'm always, as the clients are talking, I literally have like two lists. And if you've ever seen like any of the Iron Man movies, I don't know what these kind of like virtual screens he kind of has in front of him when he's in the suit, these, you know, and that's literally what it's like. So it's sort of like being Iron Man when I do therapy, but I have this list of like all of the potential strengths and I list them out and I have all the symptoms, you know, for my DSM, I have another list for all the problems down here, but I have these two lists that I'm constantly like sorting and listening as they talk. And especially when you're doing um, solution oriented work, you want to be, you're going to, you, you want to have that list ready to go when you get into, okay, so what, what's it going to look like to be one point higher on that scaling question? I go straight to that list of possible strengths, you know, and resources to draw from, to help the clients figure out what might actually work in their real life. So this takes a lot of work. And so instead of, you know, just classic, let's say CBT, where you're just tracking the symptoms and whether they're better each week, um, as a solution focused person, you are working harder to get that list of strengths and you're actually tracking both of these because you got to have the symptoms for doc documentation usually. So, but you're usually tracking both of these as a solution focused uh, therapist. So let's take a quick look at the overview of treatment. So in a nutshell, I'm telling you, in a nutshell, it is small steps to enacting solutions, okay? Emphasis on the enacting part. So you the, the main thing you're going to do, even if you're talking about problems, you are going to talk, move in the direction of talking of preferred solutions, okay? And then usually on a weekly basis, you're identifying one small, and it has to be small enough to be easily achievable. There are no resistant clients and solution focused. You know, what's one small step that would move them up the scale to their preferred, you know, level 10 solution? Very small usually. And so you sometimes have to work with clients to feel what's realistic for them, but small steps. It's often a time limited approach, but it does not have to be. Certainly, you know, when you're working with clients with more complex problems, it, you know, like sexual abuse or, you know, substance abuse, it can take years. And so you're not kicking the clients out the door, but there is this, let's make change happen as soon as possible. Another reason it's very popular in like school-based work, in crisis-based work, because it is definitely a, a, a good fit. If you've got time limited therapy, it certainly is one of the most efficient and quick ways to achieve change. And, and also to do so like in a school environment where a, 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 clinic, a school counselor can have a very large caseload, um, the solution oriented work I think is also a very safe way to work especially in like a school context or crisis oriented context because you're not delving and opening up trauma wounds accidentally with this one usually. It's all very salute enacting the solution. And so what's nice about it is it can be used. That's why life coaches use it. You can use it without getting into accidentally or intentionally kind of triggering um, some more painful emotions. So this is why you'll see it's used widely also in para by paraprofessionals. So the therapeutic relationship. So the therapeutic relationship and solution-oriented work actually evolved out of, you know, the systemic approach, which um, I think is often misunderstood. And, and what's interesting about solution-oriented therapy of all the therapeutic approaches out there, it is the only one I'm aware of that started with a using systems theory as its kind of philosophical theoretical foundations, and the same practices um, evolved to have a more postmodern feel to it. But the, that being said, second order kind of systems work and postmodernism. I have other lectures on this. You can find it there. Uh, get that defined. They actually have a very similar outlook where they're looking at how the clinician is affecting the client's reality and shaping it. And this is why that attention to language 
is so important. This is where some of that Ericksonian, you know, hypnosis, I, I think there's always a, a thread of this in there when it's done well. And this is actually the part, believe it or not, that's the hardest to learn. It takes the longest time to learn how to choose each and every word, each and every kind of nonverbal in a way that kind of calls forth the client's resiliency and strength. And so this is the part that really sets a well-trained solution focused clinician apart from someone who just read it in a book and, and, you know, is using the scripted question. So there is a difference, I would say. And so, um, you know, Bill O'Hanlon talks a lot about this Zen of viewing or the beginner's mind. So it's drawing on Buddhist psychology where the therapist is just curious to you come at it with a blank slate. You're not dragging your DSM along with you and all of that knowing. So again, it's another way of using the not knowing that you hear about in the collaborative therapy that you hear in postmodern therapies. They come at it also with this very open mind, very curious, um, wanting to learn not only what the problem is, but you know how, what happens when there are exceptions. What is it that the client would see is if this problem were totally gone? What would their life look like? There's this real curiosity, open-minded, not dragging a lot of assumptions into it. Um, so kind of using this very open-minded perspective. And so one of the quotes they will say, you know, draw from, and I think this comes out of Zen Buddhism. You know, in the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. In the expert's mind, there are few. And so you also know the non-expert, you know, um, mindset is talked about in collaborative, but you will also hear many, you know, contemporary solution-focused therapists also cite that, not knowing beginner's mind. So one of the things they do also is they do echo back the client's key words but they're doing so in a way um, that is sometimes called Carl Rogers with a twist, or also you'll hear it called channeling language. And this is also where I think we're pulling in a little bit of that Ericksonian hypnosis, and this is the more subtle piece of it. So one of the things, for example, when they're reflecting back, so it's Carl Rogers, you're going to reflect back, you know, that they've been feeling maybe very depressed, right? but you're going to add things to it like for the last three months. Okay. So in a humanistic approach, you'll say, wow. So it sounds like you've really been feeling depressed or, you know, betrayed or, you know, uh, there's been this, a lot of anxiety, but you're going to be adding, uh, uh, you're going to delimit it by saying over the past three months. And when you say you've been really feeling down, let's say over the past three months, what you've done there is that description says, oh, but three months before that, you were feeling better. Okay, right? So now you've just made the problem smaller because we all know if you're feeling super anxious or super depressed or super frustrated with your partner, it feels like it's been forever when you're in the middle of it. And so what you've just done when you put the time limit on it um, is you're, you're kind of limiting how big this problem is. You can also do it with context, right? So oftentimes many people are, their, their mood gets better at work or at school, but as soon as they come home in the evening, their, their mood gets worse when they wake up in the morning. So you would reflect that back. And so you would say something like, so over the past several months, it's been so hard for you to like even get yourself up out of bed, but you can go to work and things are pretty good there. But then as soon as you come home, it just feels like this huge weight is back on your shoulders. So I have reflected back the emotion, but I have put in the exception there. <laughs> okay. And so this is where you're, you're, you're looking for where the limits are, where the problem stops and starts or where it's more severe and less severe. Um, if you're going to use a client's language. So if the client is not saying depressed or major depressive disorder or OCD, you're going to use the client's language so that these times where you feel like you've got the weight of the world on your shoulders, rather than saying you feel depressed. Now, why? Or you feel blue rather than depressed. You feel, you know, jittery rather than anxious. So, you know, you feel at odds, you know, with your, with your, you know, partner, you'll use their language because there are fewer 
I'm going to just borrow from narrative therapy here, dominant discourses. They're about that. There are fewer people talking about the weight of the world on their shoulder than there are talking about major depressive disorder. And so, and there are a lot of experts who talk about major depressive disorder. And, but when you use the term, I've got the weight of the world, you know, on my shoulder, I feel overwhelmed or burned out. When you use kind of more the client's natural, I will say non-clinical language to describe problems, they're just more solvable. So you're always going to use the client's language over the DSM language. And then even if they come in, sometimes I have some people who are really like attached to their DSM label, you know, I will even listen for some of the more generic non-technical terms to kind of label it so that it becomes more solvable because treating major depressive disorder sounds a lot harder than, you know, I've got, you know, treating, having the weight of the world on your shoulders. Okay. Most people are going to hear major depressive disorder. Oh my God, I need expert intervention. How many doctors do I need to see? You know, let me, let me go Google that. And you're going to get all the good information from Google on that. And you get all of these other negative kind of problem saturated voices in there versus the way of the world on their shoulder. We're going to custom design our own unique, um, antidote to weight of the world on their shoulders. And that we can kind of customize for the client ourselves so um optimism and hope if you're a solution focused therapist in action you will notice that there is a ton of optimism and a ton of hope and there's also a fundamental assumption that all clients are capable of enacting their preferred solutions to their presenting problems like that is assumed that they so one of the other things you will hear, and this is can come out of Ericksonian. So when this problem is resolved is the start to some of the questions they will ask. There is this assumption, and you can see this is something that you would see in the hypnosis too. There's a day where this is gone. It's very important to get clients into that mindset, which is definitely something they do early in treatment. So let's get to that. Okay, so case conceptualization and assessment. So. One of the major places where um, solution-focused therapists start is with what they call the miracle question, or later there have been other variations on this, the crystal ball, magic wand, time machine. So here, what we're doing is we are helping the, we are helping the client. So no, clients don't do this easily without our help. Sometimes my students come back, it didn't work. I did the miracle question. It didn't work. And, um, and it's because you didn't, you didn't help them enough to get there. So, but you help them envision a problem, a future without the problem. And this is, um, I think there, I think when done well, there is a um, real meditative, or I think of it as meditative Ericksonian hypnosis type of quality, because you have to help the person envision the future and get into it, feel it, and almost like visit that future reality for a moment, okay? That's your job. No, they aren't going to go there without a lot of help. And I do think the best place this is written up, I do have it summarized in my textbooks, but you also see it in More Than Miracles. In, I believe it's a chapter authored by Insu. Um, it's the last book published under Steve DeShazer's name. Um, More Than Miracles is where I finally, after all these years, uh, they did a beautiful description of this. Um, so what you're going to do, though, is you you get, you actually kind of lead the client into I, I think of it as a, a little bit of a guided meditation or a little bit of a light trance type thing, but you're not calling it you're not having them close your eyes or anything like this. And you will see that Sue in Sue Kimberg has these places where she pauses and waits for the client to um, respond. So the um, miracle question that I have more fully described in the book, though it starts out is you just have the client literally imagine, and you often will do this in the first session or certainly early in treatment, you know, and you have them imagine that you you leave the session. Imagine you left this session. And, and so here you need to say, you know, whether they drive or, you know, take a train to get to see you and you get in your car, you drive home and you literally give them what the rest of their day would sort of look like, right? And, and then you, and, and so you, you know, you have, and you make sure they're kind of following along. You're like, and then you say the next morning you wake up and you don't know, but while you were sleeping, a miracle happened and everything, everything that you came to get help from me today suddenly was resolved. 
but you don't know this. It happened while you were asleep and you have no idea. And then you invite the client to describe what the day is going to look like. And yes, they are probably going to wake up and say, I wake up and I suddenly don't feel depressed. Okay. So, you know, hopefully by now we're not going to go with that negative description. Solution focused therapists are always looking for. So what do you, it's, it doesn't matter what you're not doing. What are you doing? What, you know, what are you doing? Because um, so if you're not depressed, you know, how are you feeling? Okay. You're feeling energetic and hopeful and you're looking forward to your day. Great. So then you wake up and you have all this energy and you're hopeful about your day. You're enthusiastic about your day. So what do you do next? And see, notice you're, you're asking, what do you do next? Not what do you feel or what do you think? What do you do next? And you have them literally walk you through what the day would look like. What are they doing? Is You know, you don't say, don't tell me what you're not going to do. You don't say that. You just, if they give you what they're not doing, then say, so what are you doing instead? Okay. And you'll notice that's a real theme here with this approach because clients will always tell you what, what's not happening. So what are you doing instead? So if you're not, you know, hitting your snooze button four times and avoiding, you know, putting the pillow over your head, what do you do instead? Well, I get up and I have coffee with my partner, you know, and I go for a run. Okay. So you're getting par coffee with your partner. You're going for your run. You know, what happens next? You know, I go to my office and I see my to-do list and I feel like I can handle it and I'm friendly to everyone when I walk in the door, you know, whatever. And my boss is, you know, not, you know, arguing with you. So if your boss isn't coming in and complaining, so what, you know, so you literally go through what they and everyone else and, and what's going different and, and you're listening and just noticing. And sometimes they give you ridiculous responses. You know, I wake up in a mansion, you know, and go with it. Don't, don't fight with them. Well, don't say, well, give me something realistic. Yeah, you're going to ruin the mood here. So, so you wake up in this beautiful home on the beach, you know, and then what do you do? And you just keep going and keep going until, you know, and you will be picking up clues along the way of what um, the solution looks like. And so there is an art to doing this, to helping clients. You have to be in the right place for them to even follow along. Because if you ask it in a very flat way, where you're not kind of playful. In fact, oftentimes you say, I'm just going to ask you a series of, of somewhat, you know, outlandish maybe questions, but just can you, can you, are you willing to go with me? You know, and that is one of the first things. Yes, I'm willing to follow along with your kind of strange questions. Okay. Um, so you, that's even part of a little bit of the induction there. So, but you take them, them on this journey, okay? And, you know, if your clients aren't giving you the responses that you think are useful or helpful, you need to ask better follow-up questions to help flesh it all out. Um, there is an art to asking these questions. You can similarly ask if I had a crystal ball and we looked into the future where the problems resolved, what are we seeing? You can ask if I had a magic wand and I could wave it right now. You know, what would suddenly be different when you went home? And you can ask a time machine. So if we had a time machine that could take us to the point where this problem no longer exists, what's happening there? So that's how you assess. That's the, probably the quickest way to assess the solution. They also will be looking quite a bit at what works. Um, and so, and, and looking for exceptions. So there are many ways that you like this constant exception, what works radar is constantly running when you're working this way. So indirectly, you're going to get lots of descriptions of when the problem's less severe, when it suddenly doesn't happen or didn't happen one time, you're going to ask what the context is um, and why things aren't worse than they are. And then sometimes you're going to ask directly, you know, you know, when are, when is the problem less severe? When is, you know, or there are certain places or relationships where the problem doesn't happen. Um, why do you think it's not worse than it is? So, um, and you're going to use all of these are kind of like clues as to what might work. Okay. And so, and sometimes it's very obvious and sometimes it takes a little more work to get there. So, but you're just constantly collecting these. And like I said, I had this running list of strengths and possibilities, things that seem to work, context. Sometimes it's real obvious and easy to recreate. Sometimes it's not. So sometimes it really does feel like a clue. Um, but you're just constantly like gathering these exceptions. 
So another thing that you're going to do when you hear about a time, you hear about the preferred solution actually spontaneously happening, you're going to want to get a really good description of what everyone did. So it's kind of like if you're familiar with tracking in systems therapy, the problem interaction cycle, you're tracking the solution interaction cycle, which is really important. And in my Therapy that works unifying framework. This is like one of the whole things that you assess is uh, assessing around when things are working, what is everyone doing? What is everyone feeling? What are the thoughts? What are the social location discourses around all of that, right? What's your identity? How does it shift your identity to, um, to be having these positive interactions? Really important for solidifying gains, I think, in any approach. So you're also listening for those strengths and resources and just constantly, you get better at this. You get better um, at, at, at listening for this. It becomes almost like instead of hearing all the problems, you, you hear all the solutions. And when I first started training, doing a lot of training in this, it would be really funny. I remember when I was a new professor, it would come time to review my students in their traineeship sites. And I literally had trouble because that list of what they were doing wrong was not well built out. I could just describe all of their great moments. And I literally had, could not track that, you know, anything they did wrong. And one time I know someone forgot to like uh, correctly um, document some child abuse. And I, when I was filling out the form like that, it was, that was the last thing that came to mind about, I didn't remember it. I didn't even put it on their evaluation. I remember when did the verbal, I'm like, oh, I forgot to put that, that day that that went really wrong, didn't get in your eval, because I literally wouldn't remember it. So you really build this filter for noticing the positive. And there is an older concept in the literature where they're assessing for the customer for change, the complainant and the visitor. And the customer for change is the person who's ready to go. They're taking responsibility. You give them a homework assignment and they're on it. Okay. And most of us, you know, act like all of our clients start there. Most of them don't. Um, where the visitor is someone who is just passing through, usually a parent or a court or a partner has dragged them into uh, therapy uh, against their will, and they're not real motivated to do stuff between session. And then you have the complainant is someone who's complaining about somebody else and see the problem outside of themselves. And so the idea here is just maybe bringing more of that focus, you know, back on So, But what can you do this week, you know, over the next week, you know, over the, between now and the next time we meet, what can you influence? So just different ways, maybe a framing is kind of where these um, concepts come from, but not to be used in a way that pathologizes or one's better than the other. It's more helping us size what we're asking our clients for between sessions. And someone who's a customer for change, you can give them kind of bigger assignments then you can someone who feels like a visitor or a complainant where it doesn't feel like I should be here anyway, or it's not really my problem. Um, there's someone else who's the real source of the problem. You probably give them smaller assignments between sessions. So let's look at some of these interventions. So here are some of the basic tenets of solution-oriented work, which does really distinguish it from a lot of other approaches. So the first is, if it isn't broken, don't fix it. This also goes way back to MRI. That was their motto. You don't go looking for problems. If the client's saying, this is working for me, I mean, as long as no one is being hurt, it's not unethical or illegal, um, you kind of leave it alone. <laughs> the other, the next, so the opposite of this, whatever's working, do more of it. And so whatever seems to be helping, do figure out what that is and do more of it. If whatever you're doing isn't working, do something different. This goes actually right back to MRI, where they're in the MRI systemic. They always did a 180 shift. So if punishing your client, your, your your client, your student, not your student, your child uh, a lot is not working on creating change, punish less, build a relationship. So, and this is actually what I see a lot in families where parents use these heavier and heavier and heavier punishments with kids. And there's a certain point where the kids are like, whatever, take my phone. You can have it all you want. I'm done wanting it because you keep torturing me with it. So usually in those cases, what you do need to do is build a relationship. And so whatever, if it's, if it's not working, do something different, usually a 180 shift. Um, 
small steps lead to big changes. This is certainly something I think most clinicians need to live and experience, to notice the difference. I have a whole series of videos um, on YouTube on there, just online and in my trainings. You know, I, I write my text, my 1500 page textbooks, five minutes at a time. And that small step, you know, a little, little change, you know, um, I've had people really have huge shifts, just adding 10 minutes of exercise or meditation, five minutes of meditation, 10 minutes of exercise to their routine. These small steps all lead to huge change. And I think where most clinicians go wrong is they're reading some textbook or manual that tell, gives these homework assignments that are way too big to be realistic. Like anyone 20, asking your client to meditate 20 minutes a time, a minute a day is outrageously unrealistic if they have a full-time job, if they have kids, you know, two to five minutes is what is realistic. And, and so a lot of, I think people, both clinicians and clients totally underestimate how that two to five minute or 10 minute change in their life is going to start a cascade of things in the right direction. Um, one of the things that Steve was routinely challenged on early in his career is his assertion that the solution is not necessarily related to the problem. Sometimes it is folks, okay? Sometimes it is, but sometimes it's not. And he got this a lot from, you know, treating people with depression or anxiety where, you know, this person can be, you know, clinically depressed, but sometimes maybe the solution is, you know, restarting their workout route, going back to their workout routine or a social reconnecting with an old friend, you know, it's like, yeah, it's sort of maybe related, but it's, you know, it's, you're not going to get there very far if you sit there reflecting on their depressed emotions to figure out what actually needs to change for, for real world change to happen. And actually I see that a lot with depression. Um, there are a lot of things with treating depression that you can sit there and process the feeling loss of interest and depressed mood and no purpose. And, you know, life is so unfair and you can, you can sit there and reflect and la, 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 la. But, you know, oftentimes it's like, get back to the gym, call your friends. <laughs> and these are the things that actually, um, get the change happening. So, um, I, I, you know, so there's definitely some truth to, you know, and there are other times, obviously, where the solution is related to the problem. He's not saying it's never related, but don't assume that analyzing the problem is actually going to help make the client achieve change. And that I think is definitely true. And there's a lot of research to support that. The language for solution development is different from that needed to describe a problem. And so this is why, um, that that attention to solution language is very, it is different. And that's that subtle part of this that is the last piece to click in when you, when you work this way. It's the hardest one to develop where every word you choose is shaping either a world of possibility or a world that limits possibility. And that takes a lot, that takes, and that's that subtle learning how to use your language um, to say, yeah, you know, so the last three months have been um, developed. I mean, the last three months have been, uh, the, the this depression has developed. So, you know, you've really been feeling down for the past three months. Um, you know, that's an important thing to say. No problem happens all the time. There are always exceptions that can be utilized. Yep. And so you just have, and if a client says, no, I've been depressed every single day for the last two years, then you're going to go in there and say, so is there ever a time where you're less depressed, you know? Um, or is it less severe or that it changes? Like how, when you're depressed at home, how is that different when you're depressed at work? So you're going to look for those differences, you know, with couples, they, I can get that one. No, no, no. I haven't had a good day in two years. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, let's, was there any time, was there any day when you didn't fight? Was there any day of this? And so sometimes you have to work hard to find those exceptions. Like I said, finding the exceptions, finding solutions and strengths. Um, is always harder than getting clients to talk about what's not working. So, and the future is both created and negotiable. Oh, yeah. um, so knowing that you are shaping future possibilities with the words you are using um, in session. 
Okay, so probably the most frequently used uh, technique, I would say, by folks across the board outside of who may not be purely solution focused are scaling or the miracle scales. So scaling questions are used all the time for lots of different things. Um, typically, it's a one to 10 scale with the solution or the positive at 10 and the worst things I've ever been at one. Okay. And you can use this for everything. You can use it for long-term goal setting. So after you do the miracle question, and you, so if 10 is what your life looks like on that miracle day, and one is the worst it's been, you know, um, ever. So where are you today? Okay. So you're at a two. And so, you know, what makes it, why is today better than a one than your worst day? So you'd even begin by scaling backwards. Why is today a two where you have been as low as a one in the past couple of years? So what's better right now between one and two, right? And so you can use it for the long-term goal setting. You can, you know, assessing what seems to help. Um, and then the simplest thing I would say to when you don't know what to do in session, you can always use a scaling question. So you're at a two today. And typically you would say, well, what would it take to get to just a two and a half or a three? Two and a half, depending how pessimistic they are. Three, the more they're a customer for change, you can have it more at a three if someone's a little more not doesn't have a lot of hope, doesn't feel like they have a lot of resources to make changes. You just say, so what would it be like next week's a two and a half? What would be different? Now, often what happens is they're describing eight, nine, and 10, and you need to reel it back in. You're like, wow, that sounds more like an eight or a nine. I'm just saying like, if we went from a two to a two and a half, what little things would be different next week? So you have to reel them back in <laughs> and make that distinction between two and two and a half. Okay, and then once they say what might be different, um, you're listening and having them list out a, two or three things until you think, okay, these last two things, we can probably make that happen. Not everything that might be different is easily quantifiable or broken down into a task between session. So you're working, you're working hard. It may look like you're, you're not doing anything, but this is actually a lot of very subtle work. So, um, Okay, so if two and a half would mean you got up and um, whatever, had coffee with your partner, or you got up and you at least did five minutes on your treadmill. Okay, so what would it take for that to happen? Let's do the treadmill thing. Okay, so you need to set your alarm and you don't always get up with your alarm. So how are we going to make that happen? Oh, we have another alarm for you to go to sleep earlier at night. Okay. And you're going to need a huge cup of coffee to get on that treadmill. Okay, so let's set that coffee maker. Can you do you have one that you can program the night before so you can smell the coffee? Okay, we got the so now you need a reminder to make the coffee happen. So you got to set that up, you know, before you go to bed. And you're literally, you know, figuring out how to make this happen down to setting the coffee maker and the timers. And you know, what are, what's the likelihood you think you're going to really do this? Hopefully, that's not a ten or you know higher. Um, and, you know, what are the most likely reasons for you not to follow through on this task? Oh, you stayed up too late watching, you know, binge watching a show. Okay, so how do we make sure you don't do that? I mean, you get into the weeds, folks. <laughs> you get into the nitty gritty of their life to make sure thing, you know, that there's a chance they can come back at a two and a half next week. So... So you really get into that and then you you can just rinse and repeat that from session to session. So you really get in there. And then you're also measuring progress this way. So, okay. So that is the um, kind of scaling question that you can use. And literally you can check in how their week was for five to 10 minutes, scale it. You know, then you spend the next 40 minutes literally micro managing how to get to the next step, you know, how they feel about that, how confident you on a scale from one to 10 that you can make this happen. Oh, you're only at a five. Okay. If they're only at a five, then you need to go back and either add more things, you know, to help or to scale back the size of the step. Um, so you really want to get in there to make sure they succeed at that. Okay. And when they come back, so you'd be curious what, you know, what, whether or not they could do it. And if they couldn't, then you get feedback. Oh, you, oh, you didn't identify enough um, barriers. You made the task too hard. You have the wrong, you're focusing on the wrong task. You're going to adjust. So, um, 
you know, and, and so if they did succeed, you'll, uh, you'll ask about, you know, how did that feel? Do you know, was there a shift there for you? What did you notice about how the rest of the day went? So you're always looking um, for even the ripple effects. And that's where you just have this one little change, but often there are a lot of ripple effects. God, you know, I had better energy at work. You know, I was able to focus. It was easier to fall asleep you know, whatever. So you'd have them list all of the positive things that happened as an outcome of that. So the miracle scale, you know, so zero is when you decided to seek help or one, and then miracle situation would be your 10. Okay. You can always scale back and forth. It's called the miracle scale. And then, it, you know, things were at their worst and then the solution is 10. So you have these different scales that you can work with, but in, in solution oriented therapies, your uh, 10 is always the positive outcome. Other approaches like uh, CBT, it can be reversed, um, but that's just always how they uh, work. So especially for your pessimistic clients, one thing different. And so what you want to do is really find one small thing, especially early in treatment before you have like the positive momentum building up. And you want to keep it small enough so that they can follow through on it, you know? Um, so if, if, you know, the client's goal is to hang out more with their friends and they've totally become, you know, alienated from them in the past months, you'll just start by calling or texting a friend, right? The smallest little change, you know? And so oftentimes a little text conversation ends up in a phone call or a visit and you don't go for the visit from the beginning. You start with just text them and say hi, and you've been thinking of them. Sorry, you dropped off the radar. Start there. See what happens. You make that the smallest threshold um, possible to jump over. But you know, not every time, but often this will start this cascade ripple effect. There is a great story um, with Milton Erickson that I will share. Um, he was known for his one session miracle sessions. He really was one second, you know, he had one, he had one session miracles all the time. That's why Erickson was so uh, famous. So there's this beautiful story about um, how he visited um, a woman who was very depressed. She was elderly. She lived in this, you know, older home by herself. And somehow I know it was a Victorian home <laughs> and this beautiful Victorian home, but all the furniture was like covered in plastic. You know, and everything was just kind of covered in plastic because no one was using it anymore. And so Erickson toured this whole beautiful older home. And at the end, though, they end up um, in a, um, a greenhouse where she is growing violence, African violence. And, and Erickson noticed after going through this physical tour of her house, the only place where there was life in the house, because everything was like shuttered up, old, it was old furniture covered up in plastic. The only place that there was life was the greenhouse with these African violets. And so Erickson does this little tour of the house. She talks about how she's been depressed and lonely. And Erickson also hears that she's still active in her church. It's one of the few times she actually gets out in the community as she goes to church every Sunday. And he doesn't sit and talk and process her emotions. She doesn't, he doesn't come up with a list of, you know, um, all these suggestions, you know, but what, what he does get around to telling her is like, wow, so you, you do go to church every Sunday and do you share your violets with the community? Like when people are getting married or having babies or, you know, lose a loved one. And so she's like, no, I've never done that, you know, or whatever. Somehow he plants this seed with her. And a, a few years later in the mail, he gets a newspaper clipping um, that says, you know, African violet queen passes away. And what this woman did after his, you know, visit to her home where he just noticed where the life was in her life and notice hearing about the church community, put those two things together. And she just started um, this thing where she knew how to clip and grow these African violets. And so she'd grow African violets. And whenever there was a wedding, a birth or a death, you know, or um, illness in the church community, she would go out and deliver them an African violet. And um, she lived a very happy life in those last few years doing that. So this is that one thing different. So did he sit there and process all of her depressed mo emotions and her feelings of isolation and loneliness? No, he just noticed where the life was, where life was growing. 
And, and so, you know, I, you can do this with your clients. You can see their faces light up when they talk about where there is life in their, in their lives. And so you, you look for that, you notice that, and you, you find ways to put those strengths together, but it's a beautiful story of how he put these two strengths together. And I'm sure did a lot more good than many clinicians could do in one session. Um, by just doing one thing different, noticing where life is, noticing where the, where the little glimpses of joy are in her life. Um, and so I think it's a, it's a great story to just capture the spirit of this approach. There are tons of solution-focused uh, interventions, especially that have been developed in the last 10 years or so. So you, we've got the scaling questions for weekly task assignment we've talked about. And the formula for a session task is, a, is it's a formula task, meaning was used with every um, client, which was between now and the next time we meet, I want you to go home and notice what's working in your life. Because a lot of things are going to start to change. And I want you to go home and bring me back a list of things you don't want to change so that we don't, you know, um, accidentally change something that you like. I'm telling you, there's so much Ericksonian, you know, hypnosis going on here. So what they're doing is go home and see what's working. Go home and see what you do like about your relationships. Go home and see where you are sort of happy, what parts of your life you enjoy right now the way it is. So you go home and you do, it's kind of a gratitude type of exercise, you know, but you're just noticing what works, what's good. And again, it, it shifts, it helps them shift their perspective to what is working because most people like literally can't see it because they're so overcome with what John Gottman would call the negative interpretive set. They can only see the problem. They can't see what's working. And so this is a great intervention for kind of lifting that veil, that problem saturated veil. As I just like calling it that metaphor. It's my just called it the problem saturated veil. Um, I just made that up just so you know, it's not in a book, um, but I like it. I think it goes back to the African pilot queen here asking presuppositional questions. So that is they presume literally. So when this problem has been resolved, you know, what, how do you think things would be different at home when this problem is resolved? How do you think your day will look differently? So there is, you're just, you are presuming the problem is going to be resolved. That is just part of your worldview when you work this way. Utilization, a good example was that African Violet Queen, but you're utilizing those strengths in different contexts. So what is working? How do we get that to work in a different context? Um, coping questions, how have you coped with this? This is such a painful situation. How have you coped with it? Um, all of these years, it's very empathetic. It's very respectful. And boy, you get a nice long list of strengths usually from asking that question. So, and just noticing the difference or knowing the difference between compliments and in, in encouragement that is therapeutic versus an everyday compliment. So oftentimes I think um, when people hear about solution focus, they mistakenly think they're like little cheerleaders and, oh my God, it's so great. It's so awesome. I love that you did that. Um, I'm so proud of you. That That is not what I would call a therapeutic compliment. So for therapeutic compliments, what you're doing, and this is real important when working with marginalized clients, working cross-culturally, and we're always working cross-culturally. Clients sitting across from us always has a different set of values and worldviews. So, so you want to be real respectful of that because actually compliments, when you compliment that's loaded with bias. Okay. It's your value system on the client. So you need to be very careful when you compliment, you compliment from within their worldview and you're complimenting them for achieving what they set out to do from their perspective, rather than saying, I think what you did is great. That's just your opinion. You should not have your opinion in, in the session like that. What you want to say is, wow, you actually, you know, it sounds like you, you know, that you, um, you were able to really move yourself from a two to a two and a half using all the things you came up with last week and that you were able to take that and put it into practice. So you're keeping the compliment in their value system rather than inadvertently imposing your own and the, or imposing the value system of the mental health community. You really want to keep those compliments grounded and you all, it's also much more validating when you keep it on their side of the fence you know, wow, that's exactly what you hoped to do last week and you did it. That is incredible. 
So you're keeping it on the compliments on their side of the fence and being very, very careful that it's never you just saying, I really like how you did that. Try to keep that out as much as possible. Um, I mean, there are times where it's not the worst thing to do, but you do want to be really thoughtful when giving compliments because they're always loaded with bias and you need to make sure that bias will not harm your client. We can never totally be unbiased, but as much as you can. And if you can link it to what they did, um, positive psychology says they're much more likely to internalize their agency rather than seeing it coming from you in um, some way. So in terms of um, using this with specific populations, there's a lot of work using um, couples there are uh, doing solution focused work with couples and with divorce and Michelle Wiener Davis has a whole program called divorce busting using solution oriented therapy. And so it's a very positive one. It is one couples are very difficult to work with and having that positive focus on what's working. Um, and, and so some of the tips that they do here is video talk, which means you're you're having them describe what a video camera would see and then how they interpreted this. And so when you work with couples, you're getting each person's kind of basic video if we can't if you can, behaviorally what happened. Not you can't always do that because sometimes they even argue about that, but then how each person is interpreting each other and that distinction and, and being able to create verbal distinction about how each person had a very different reality around the same set of interactions, you know, is very helpful to, to begin to have them understand that each person is experiencing this very differently and it's not necessarily one's more valid than the other. And then also they talk about moving people from complaints to requests. And Gottman comes up with something similar later in his research, I noticed. But this is, you know, rather than telling some your partner what you don't want, just simply do the solution focused thing and go straight to what you do want. Don't ever tell them what you don't want. Ask for what you want in a positive way. It would really be nice if, right? The next time this happens, would you be able to do blah, blah, blah? Most of the time, if there hasn't been a ton of conflict and resentment built up, that is going to work so much better where... You know, you know, I don't like it when you do X, you know, because that, you know, cause it feels like an attack and they put a wall up. So, you know, I need you to just start doing Y instead that you're much less likely to get a good outcome. Just just totally do the solution focused thing and say, you know, it would really be wonderful if, you know, when this happens, you know, we could be doing this or you could be doing this um, and you use we instead of you, if at all humanly possible, always generally going to be more successful than telling someone what you don't want before you ask for what you do want. But instinctively, we like to complain to our partners. And so, yeah, doesn't end up as good. This uh, solution-focused work has, uh, solution -focused has actually been used extensively with sexual abuse and trauma. And that surprises some people. Um, and they really do take a very positive um focus looking at the resiliencies you know think of that coping you know questions how how have you coped why are things not worse than they you know that aren't even worse than they could be how did you get through this really honoring the agency what still is working in your life they have um Yvonne Dillon has a recovery scale where you know at the beginning of therapy rather than listing everything that's wrong they go through everything that is still working pretty well pretty darn good given everything the hell you've been through all of these areas of your life are working. That's really amazing. So we just have these things to work on. That's great. It is such a better way to start. I'm just saying. Um, so, you know, using very constructive questions, what are going to be the first smallest signs that things are starting to get better for you? Again, using video talk around, um, you know, uh, what are the symptoms that are, you know, problematic, what, you know, and what is the, how are you thinking about this? And then also when things are going well, how did they go well? And you get a really clear video description of that and everything that was going on when that was, go, um, when the solution happened. So again, it's a very strength oriented resiliency approach to working with sexual abuse and trauma. Looking at the research and evidence base, so there uh, is good, uh, and actually a, 
a rapidly growing evidence base for solution focused therapy. It has a modest effect sizes and is equivalent to most other approaches. And typically, though, it's you're going to have the same effect size, but in less time and less money. So you'll see there are a lot of people who like that. Wow, the same outcomes for less money and less time. Oh, let's go solution focused. And there has been a lot of research around the globe with solution oriented work. Um, around domestic violence, couples, schizophrenia, child abuse, um, troubled youth, school settings, parenting, alcohol, substance use, um, foster care. So it's really been used widely um, with many, many um, different populations. And it's certainly, I would say, one of the more widely used approaches today. And then in terms of working with uh, diverse clients, this is definitely an approach that is used around the globe. It is widely used around the globe. Um, it is widely used across contexts, and it is generally considered to be um, an approach that when it's done correctly, I will say, it, it, it is transfers well uh, with marginalized clients because it's focused on strengths, resiliency, you know, um, it's not shaming. And if the clinician is very careful, you know, you should not be imposing your bias. It is built into doing this approach well. Not everyone does it well, but it, 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 is, a very, it is an approach that works well with diverse clients, especially, um, you know, with Asian Americans, there's been a lot said about how it is, it is a non-shaming because they don't dive into why do we have this problem? Who caused it? You know, what's wrong with your parenting? They don't do any of that. So for any shame-based culture or any culture that is very, um, doesn't like to have the dirty laundry shared with experts, they don't have, they don't do that. Like they don't go there and the therapist doesn't drag them there. So they're, everyone's, it's a win-win, right? <laughs> Solution focused therapist is so good. We don't have to talk about, you know, all the the dark stuff or the, you know, the problem getting, you know, you know, pulled into that. We can just go straight to the solution. And the clients are like, yes, there's no shame in this approach. This is really lovely. So also with LGBTQ um, clients, this has been found to be um, a very supportive, safe, non-pathologizing, looking at all the strengths and resiliencies. And so for a lot of marginalized clients, this is like, wow, no one even sees me this way. This is so, this is so liberating. This is so freeing. This is so uplifting. And, um, and it's so refreshing, I guess is a better word. It's like, no one's ever seen me. I actually just did a, um, a session with, um, I recently did a session, um, with a, uh, it's the same sex couple who came in and one of the partners who, came in dragging and screaming and did not want to do this for months and months and delayed and dillied uh, at the end was like, oh my God, this was so helpful. <laughs> I feel so hopeful about our relationship. I had no idea that couples therapy could be like this, you know? And, and so having that positive, uplifting, very helpful, very practical approach can um, really be unexpected for a lot of, I think, especially marginalized clients. And I think for any client, quite frankly, they often feel very relieved, even if you just, you know, have this ability to really tap into and identify those strengths, generate hope. And, um, and so, you know, this is, you know, and this was a couple who's like having pretty bad arguments uh, for many days at a time that can last for a week. You know, it's pretty intense arguing there. Um, and, but yet there was that hope and, and that uh, someone sees my, our strengths, someone sees possibility for us. It can be so, so powerful and it cannot be, I think, overestimated how powerful that is. So um, just kind of to wrap up, hopefully by now you're very clear that solution-focused therapists are not uh, giving clients any type of solution or advice or helping them fix things or suggesting solutions that is like bad, bad, bad. No, 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 no. This is a very kind of postmodern social constructionist 
where you're working, you're asking a lot of, you know, questions of clients to help identify the clues, you know, as to what works, helping figuring out, you know, what the client's preferred solution looks like. And then it's your job, the work you're doing is figuring out what are the strengths, what are the resiliencies, what are the context, what do we know about this little problem that will help us enact that solution? And so and it's always about these small, concrete steps, you know, of action steps, action steps between sessions to enact the preferred solution. So there's this very heavy focus on taking meaningful action. Okay, so hopefully that um, gave you a great start to understanding solution-based therapies, uh, so, uh, solution-focused brief therapy, and solution-oriented therapies. And I invite you to, to read more and learn more about these really important approaches. Take care and be well.